Hi, this is Julie Allball from The Wedding Market. We're live here at Hilton Head Island, and we are with Angela Prophet today, and we're going to talk about how to expand your wedding business. And let's kind of start with destination weddings. Now, a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I'm going to get into destination weddings, but they don't understand there's certain things you have to do before you get into that market. Now, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, it... It's not as glamorous as it sounds. It's funny because some of the girls that I coach, they say, I want to do destination weddings. And I'll say, well, where have you traveled? And they say, oh, nowhere. I just, I want to (laughs) travel. Like, well, that's not really a good enough reason to become a planner. Um, And so I always advise people if they want to be a destination planner to make sure that you've experienced that place first before sending a client there or recommending it to a client. And so, so, I mean, that's the number one thing. We don't always have the luxury of visiting the resort sometimes. And so that's where relationships are very, very important, where you have relationships with people that you can trust. And the second big thing after relationships is you've got to do your research. Mm -hmm. You have to do your research because there's so many things destination wise especially outside of the united states that i mean i'm still learning and i've been doing destination weddings for seven years now Mm -hmm. and anytime we go to a different island or a different country we're having to research and make sure that we know what we're getting ourselves into well i can certainly see that now one of the things i think is an issue is sometimes wedding planners will go to certain countries or they might say I'm strictly for the Caribbean now before they make that step what do they need to make sure about their business already before they step on to this next level yeah well there's some planners that try to spread themselves too thin And so, for example, I'm from Nashville, and that's where I started my business, Mm -hmm. and I had a great intern program, and I started to grow a foundation locally, and to make sure that everything was solid with the business at home, at my home base, making sure the reputation, the communication, the vendor team was very solid, so that if I removed myself, that client would still have a great experience. And that's something that takes a long time and Mm -hmm. a lot of experience and so after I felt like that was solid an opportunity came my way it's not like I was seeking it out um, where I had the opportunity to travel to a private island and do a destination wedding and fortunately my very first one was very very small and so I had the opportunity to really form really good relationships and still to this day that's probably one of the islands that I work on most frequently because we form those relationships. But making sure that you're doing your business at home solidly first before you're expanding is important. Because again, if you try to spread yourself too thin, you're just gonna get a negative reputation possibly. And then you're gonna seem scattered and then it just, it's, it's not a good thing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, what would you say as far as hiring extra people Mm -hmm. to to do the destination wedding so that you're not too thin right and that's a great question and it's funny because a lot of our clients that contact us for destination weddings they ask because they're just thinking of money and travel and they're not thinking of the execution and the logistics which sometimes i have felt several times like i'm you know blindfolded with handcuffs with my hands tied behind my back (laughs) And that's where you have to sometimes spring into action and just get it all done yourself, which is a horrible feeling sometimes. It's very scary. Um, But again, like planning ahead, making sure and asking the right questions to the resort or wherever you're working and saying, you know, how involved is the staff and Mm -hmm. do they speak English and making sure that you're going to be able to communicate. There have been times where we've had to um, have a translator because I don't speak another language and it's very hard to communicate. I mean, yeah, you can point and smile, but when you're in a hurry and time is of the essence, especially at beach weddings and the sun's going down and you're losing light, you you know, that really Mm -hmm. matters. And so um, there are some resorts that we have worked at 
and their staff is amazing. And then there's other resorts, or for example, we will get a private home mm -hmm. and it comes with a chef and maybe like a person to clean up after you, but it doesn't really come with staff. And so if I don't have a local contact or a relationship with anyone locally, I definitely quote in my bid to the client to bring some people with me. And mm -hmm. often, you know, I, I at least bring one or two of the people that work with me and as my right hands. And then oftentimes times we have flown out our, our lead lighting designer, our baker, mm -hmm. our lead floral designer, um, but that's only happened a few times. I've had really good luck, like, um, by being part of organizations such as ILEA, um, mm -hmm. and having the opportunity to network. And then also, I know you and I both went mm -hmm. to Engage, mm -hmm. and that's another great conference where you can network and meet people in all types of countries. Mm -hmm. And just, again, going back to the relationships, making sure that you have people that you can trust in other areas, that's what helps make a successful event. One person cannot pull it off by themselves. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Now, um, for the audience right now, you can uh, submit questions on Facebook uh, for, to Angela right now. So make sure we'll be looking at your comments later. So put those in there and we will be responding to those questions. But getting on to, you were talking about expanding into resorts mm -hmm. and how that is another way of additional income. Absolutely. So, again, you know, you don't really seek out these opportunities. Um, but I had a resort recently. I have done several weddings there. And they have theme nights, which most resorts do. Um, that's one of the draws that mm -hmm. the guests actually look forward to. And it's their fifth year anniversary, and they've been doing the same thing for five years. Every Monday night, every Wednesday night, every Friday night, you know, for the guests. Mm -hmm. This is separate mm -hmm. from weddings. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the managers said, you know, we really want to revamp these events. And when you've been here, it it's totally different every single time. Like, how do you do that? And can you help us come up with new decor and new ideas? And, you know, it sounded like a fun project. So, you know, I said, absolutely. But, and I said, but first, before we get started, how are you going to communicate these changes, A, to the staff, and B, to the guests who come back every single year, and the homeowners, because there's a few estate homes on this island. And they said, oh my gosh, we haven't thought about that. And so before you start jumping in, making all these changes, you've got to set the expectation. Mm -hmm. And so since I'm certified um, in, true, in teaching true colors, which is a psychology test, that was in my proposal to them to do a true colors training with the staff so that we could understand how we're going to roll out all these changes. And so they were just so thankful. They're like, oh my gosh, that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've started to work on this project. Now it's probably gonna be a five or six month project, which is just like for me planning a wedding. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's still very rewarding. And where we're from, where it, when it's cold, everybody wants to have a destination wedding when it's warm. So during slow season or low season, as we would call it in the wedding industry, it's great to put yourself out there as a designer and a planner and help resorts with the logistics. Um, I have a really hard time keeping my mouth shut sometimes <laughs> and they don't even ask for my advice, but I tell them anyway in a nice way and say, you know, this could um, look a little bit better and a little bit more clean if we could do this. And once you teach them that, it, it's like you've just given somebody a million bucks and they actually appreciate the feedback. Um, and so, and I love teaching and I enjoy teaching. And so I, again, encourage planners and designers if, if they have a low season, mm -hmm. um, you know, to put yourself out there. And if you do destination weddings and you travel to resorts, like educate them and build a relationship with them because it can be a great additional source of income. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what about block rooms? How yes. can that be an additional area of income? And there's so many misconceptions about blocking rooms, mm -hmm. um, especially for destination weddings. Typically, the way it works 
is, um, you know, you get your guest list together, right? And uh -huh. you say, we have 30 families coming. And you've got to decide, are the families going to pay or is the client paying? And we have uh -huh. a little bit of both. And so if the family is paying, having a group code, um, you know, is good. But if you can work with a travel agent, and we, we work with a specific agency to help manage that experience uh -huh. so that they're not calling the hotel and getting the wrong price or the wrong arrival date or the, the wrong exit date. You know, there's all these things that can happen. Um, and so we, we try to help, again, form that relationship with an agency that can help facilitate not only the room, but also the flights and the transportation from the airport to the resort. Hmm. On the client side, um, something really important to know about room blocks is attrition. A lot of people don't know what that is. I mean, basically, you're, gear, you're guaranteeing something. Okay. So if you say, I have 30 families coming, and they say you want 30 rooms, and then again, we are very specific. Do you want beach? Do you want garden view? Do you want hillside view, mountain view? And usually, there's a different price point. Mm -hmm. um, and so knowing that, and online pictures are very deceiving, um, you know, you're pretty much guaranteeing the hotel that business. So if you don't have 30 guests coming and you've signed a contract, you're still going to have to pay for those rooms. Mm -hmm. And so that's from the client side. And then from the planner side, if you're appropriately set up, you are able to get commission from the hotels from booking rooms. And we have clients sometimes that say, well, does that cost us more? I mean, you're getting commission. And, you know, again, we have to educate them and say it actually doesn't cost you a penny. It actually saves you money mm -hmm. because if we are dealing with all these room questions and these travel questions with your guest, we're not charging you for our mm -hmm. time because we're, we're getting commission, which pays for our time to educate their guest about the rooms. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the uh, packages like with maybe sandals or some of the mm -hmm. other resorts? Is that... I mean, I mean, everybody seems to be selling some of those products. So, yep. what what is your thoughts on those kinds of well packages? Um, Sandals does a great brand. I mean, they're a great brand. They do a great job marketing. Our clients, particularly, do not go that route. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we say we're not for everybody. Just like destination planners aren't for everybody, but a lot of the resorts, you know, it's like pick A, B, or C. And um, there's even some designers that have now partnered with resorts and they call it wedding in a box, which is still very beautiful and very luxury. Um, but to me, it's not customization. And so we know our client avatar very, very well. And the clients that we service are clients that care about customization. Now customization to me may not mean customization to another planner or designer, but having a background in psychology we really try to create the space or the moment or wherever we're going based on the couple and their guest. And so we're never going to say pick A, B, or C. Like mm -hmm. we build everything from the ground up where a lot of resorts, um, they don't have that mentality and sometimes they don't have the means of doing it. And so it's hard to offer something when you're uncomfortable selling an idea. And it actually breaks my heart when people will tell me stories about, oh, we had a destination wedding. I'm like, well, how was it? Like, was your experience great? And they're like, well, I mean, it was pretty, you know, um, it, we, it was purple and blue and like, we don't love that, but that's really all they had. And it was all inclusive. I mean, it just happened to me recently. I was speaking at an event and the guy sitting next to me, I didn't know who he was. And he, you know, we introduced each other and he was like, oh, you don't remember me. Like, we were just emailing recently about my wedding. We're having a destination wedding. And I said, well, I have someone who works with me who takes care of all the emails, but what happened? Because mm -hmm. we never met. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, we booked a resort down somewhere in Mexico, and he told me where it was. <laughs> I was like, oh, did you already pay a deposit? Because in my head, I know that there's much better places that can offer a more customized experience. Mm -hmm. And I said, so how's the experience going, the planning? And he said, well, you know, they try to make it easy, but they don't have a lot of choices. And so we're just kind of settling. Oh. And that breaks my heart. You should, when you're spending money, you should not have to settle. 
you should get what you want. And some people, they don't know what they want until they're presented an option. And they're like, well, I don't really like that, but that's what's included, so I'll just go with it. Mm -hmm. So finding a, a planner and a designer who can be your voice in a positive way, I think is really important for those people that care about that. Yeah, you know, with the people, there's so much about price, but you, you have to decide, okay, is it about the price and, you know, getting a package that's in your price range or is, do you want something customized? It's just, uh, I think. But what's even more interesting is a lot of potential clients, you know, it's all about price per dollar signs. And I will tell you, we have gone in to a lot of resorts and, you know, they have their packages mm -hmm. and we'll break the packages apart and say, actually, we, we do want this, but we don't want this. And they will customize for us. Mm -hmm. And we actually end up saving the client money. Mm -hmm. And it's just, we know the right questions to ask based right. on our experience. And most of these clients, you know, it's a first or maybe second wedding, but they don't know the questions to ask. Yeah. I mean, I know that sandals had, you could do customization, mm -hmm. but maybe the make, like you said, the client didn't know to ask, mm -hmm. but I noticed also one of the biggest surprises was that flowers were not usually used from the island. They were flown yeah. in, which makes the cost higher sometimes. Yeah. So, I mean, it just really depends, um, you know, what it is that you're getting. <laughs> yep. And there's been times when we were flying flowers in and they didn't make it. And oh. so I, in the middle of the night, illegally was climbing trees, cutting flowers down for the next day. <laughs> Because, <laughs> and there's signs around the island that say, say like you can't you're not supposed to cut the vegetate or whatever yeah all right you know right. and i'm just like we have to have something tomorrow that's where you like mm -hmm. just jump into work mode um and they didn't come and oh. so thank goodness i know how to do flowers i mean i'm not a floral designer we have a, a team that does that but i know how to do it a little bit um, and so I, I just had to make do and there were beautiful Hawaiian like tropical we were not in Hawaii but they were like tropical flowers and um, there's a lot you have to deal with like with customs and making sure that you get them the right paperwork and the receipts I mean the the stuff that we have had to do in some of the different countries if clients knew behind the scenes like they would probably like cancel their event and say I'm not doing this this is too hard um, it's, it's, it's a lot sometimes. So you kind of have to be ready for anything and know how to jump into action and just fix it. <laughs> and I did not go to jail. Okay. Angela didn't go to jail. <laughs> for cutting down some flowers. <laughs> now, uh, talking about making money with your core services first before you start expanding. You mm -hmm. want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, one of the classes that I'm teaching now is all about productivity. And when you're more productive, you're typically profitable. And a lot of my students, you know, I will ask them to break out their overhead. And they're like, well, I don't have any overhead. I work out of my home. I'm like, do you have a car? Do you put gas in your car? Do you have a computer? Do you email? Do you have a website? Do you, um, do you advertise mm -hmm. on Facebook? Like there's all these things that people are kind of missing that they think, oh, I don't have any overhead, mm -hmm. but you do have overhead. And so finding out like your operating cost and then what you pay your team and then making mm -hmm. sure, and then you have money for taxes mm -hmm. and insurance and your business license. Like there's all these things that you should add up. And so I know every year to operate the business correctly, I need to make X amount of dollars. And then, and then anything over that is then profit. Mm -hmm. But someone taught me that. I did not go to school for any of that. Um, and I have a wonderful accounting firm that I've worked with for a long time and a great business manager that they've, they've taught me. And a lot of wedding planners and designers in this industry who kind of just start out for fun, they don't know if they're making money and they don't know how. And so making sure that you separate your overhead and paying your team and then making sure you're making money and, and making a profit before you say, oh, I'm going to go out and do destination planning or I'm going to make money just doing logistics and not design. But then your logistical plan isn't solid and you don't have a process and you don't have a strategy. 
And again, that's like a recipe for kind of disaster. So mm-hmm. you really, you know, for a lot of planners, um, you know, they say I'm a one woman show. Like I don't have a business manager. I don't have an accountant. And I remind people for seven years, I didn't have anybody either. It was me. And I, I did have a real job. I had a full-time job at the hospital with what my parents say. I went to college for my real job. Um, <laughs> but then after I started to expand and I left the healthcare industry, you know, I started to see very quickly, I need to surround myself with really good people who are strong at what I'm not strong at. So accounting and business managing. And I, I went to SCORE classes, which are actually free. And join really? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and join several organizations, and let me tell you, it's not fun. Like, as a designer who loves to be creative and like dream in la la land and like shop for clients, like budgets are not fun and overhead is not fun. But you can't just go through life owning a business, just spending all this money, having fun when you don't know if you're actually making a profit. Mm-hmm. At least I've never met anybody that could do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, what kind of software would you think would be really helpful to get a clear picture of what the operating cost? Is there ones that you think are better than others? Yeah, I mean, well, we we use QuickBooks and mm-hmm. o- online, mm-hmm. which integrates with our overall software, which is Infusionsoft. And but for for newer people that don't really have anything, and they're like, I'm just using an Excel spreadsheet, which is okay. I mean, mm-hmm. it's better than nothing. Um, but again, getting a strategy and a process. And so there's, um, there's hours keeper. That's a free app where you can Mm -hmm. track your hours, bill your clients, keep up with your expenses. There's Expensify. We keep up with our receipts in Evernote because it's searchable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of free things out there, but typically I tell people, I mean, we pay for so many softwares that are ten dollars a month, ten dollars a month, ten dollars a month. Mm-hmm. And it all adds up it after our does. time. It does add up. However, you know, like for example, let's just say ten times ten. You know, our time planning mm-hmm. and designing and selling to clients is way worth more than ten dollars a month for all these services. So making sure that you're using a software and the numbers don't lie and the software doesn't lie. And so if you're doing the checkbook by hand, I mean, human error is a lot more prevalent than, than a software right. would be. Now, I notice even for whether you're a wedding planner or other types of wedding professionals, DJs, what have you, I'm just noticing that there's a lot of new software that's coming out for that particular niche, mm-hmm. whether it be a DJ, a wedding planner. Um, that might do contracts as well as get the obtain the money Mm -hmm. uh all of it in one package but Mm -hmm. i don't know i mean i like using the separate product so i don't know what you're feeling do you like to get like the contracts separately from you know using different apps for the different or do you like to use one program that does it all well in our industry there is not one program that will do it all okay and do it well okay nothing Nothing. yet yeah and in fact i don't think that's a bad thing um Mm -hmm. in a perfect world people would say like why isn't there one thing that does everything Mm -hmm. personally being on the very tech tech side of things um you know you hear that saying never put all your eggs in one basket right yes yes so if one thing goes down your other stuff does not go down. And I'll give you a great example. Recently, a software went down and I was actually on a trip. I think I was on a site visit for a client mm-hmm. and people were saying, I can't access access this, I can't access that. And you know, I was in meetings and so I really wasn't paying attention until later. And for about six hours, there was a major, major, major platform <laughs> that was down. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of mad people. And so I personally like having different programs um, for that very reason. But I will also say that a lot of the programs we use, they're not marketed at all to the wedding industry. Hmm. Um, they are, there are more products coming out that are heavily marketed to the wedding industry, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. But I also look at how long have you been in business? How long are you gonna be in business? Like, okay, Google is not going anywhere. 
Facebook is probably not going anywhere. <laughs> Although I will say, you know, we keep everything separate. Like we own our raves. I mean, I had a widget one time through Facebook and they changed a code and I lost all of my raves because I was doing it through Facebook. So you learn in those situations mm -hmm. like, oh, you should own the content and then make sure you always have a backup. Right. So for like contracts, like DocuSign is very well known. Mm -hmm. um, Google Docs is really well known for like Word and Excel documents to share with your clients. Uh, I will say the best software though that is solely marketed to the wedding industry is for timelines and it's called Timeline Genius. And um, the developer of that, him and his wife, when they were planning their wedding and getting married, they had a, an experience where they created this software to come up with this timeline and they've really, really done a nice job. And I've seen them grow over the past four years. Um, and so they're not going anywhere. And so I'm comfortable putting all of my data in there now because I know they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to have new p things work the kinks out before I jump in. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess the other thing I, I noticed, someone actually emailed me about some software. Uh -huh. And it was about doing automated emails. Well, mm -hmm. let me tell you what happened. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The, the, the guy was trying to promote this software. Uh -huh. And he kept emailing me. Automated. It was automated. And it was after I told him I'd already had a discussion with him. Yeah. But they kept coming. Yeah. I thought... This is not going to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if it's going to be automated, it has to be, you have to know when the person has responded. Absolutely. Has responded and then know what the next email is. And so it was just, you know. <laughs> it will, in, in our, the wedding industry specifically, it's so personal. Mm -hmm. And so if it looks like you've messed up or you forgot something or you don't know what you're talking about, um, that's bad. I mean, mm -hmm. your client can, you can lose their trust like that. We do use some automation and I will say that it does save time. And, mm -hmm. um, and we actually tell our clients when they hire us, like, Hey, we're going to put you into our automated system. So if you get a reminder about your invitations going out and we've already mailed them, just ignore it. But you can go into the system and set up, we call it a campaign. So the client, let's say you're getting mar married January 1st, or you hire us January 1st of 2016, you're getting married January 1st, 2017. You know, in a perfect world, all the dates would populate and the reminders would populate for the automated emails. But that never happens. It's never, you know, we'll plan something where we have 18 months and then we have two months to plan something. Mm. So when it comes to really hands-on planning, automation doesn't really work. For invoices and things like that, um, the reminders to clients to pay, I think automation is great for stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, I just thought that was, you know, and then the, I wanted to show the example. I know we're getting closer to the end of the show, but um, as far as the flood yes. in Nashville and how you were talking to me mm -hmm. uh, previously about how that kind of changed your perspective on going paperless. Yeah, I mean, it really, it changed... I feel like Nashville's life. Um, so being in healthcare, I, when I worked in mental health, EMR, which is electronic medical records, did not exist. I had to hand chart for every patient. And then if I didn't chart appropriately, the insurance wouldn't pay the bill, mm -hmm. which if you go to the doctor, you know, you get a bill. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have insurance, you know, you want your insurance to pay for it. So, you know, it will come back and bite you if you don't chart correctly. Mm -hmm. And then as I got more into healthcare, the government started to mandate EMR. Mm -hmm. And so I was hired um, for a year to like literally be the cheerleader. Mm -hmm. And I would go around to doctor's offices and help implement EMR and show them how powerful being paperless and everything being on electronics is going to save them space and time. and. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to get people to change. So when I started the company, kind of for fun and by accident, it was all paperless. I've always been paperless from a very young age. And, you know, bad things have happened, like my purse was stolen, my planner was in it. 
So for years, I was on my vendors. I'm like, you guys have got to get Dropbox. You got to use Google Drive. You got to back up your stuff. And and I was on them constantly. And they're like, oh, our process is fine. Which let me tell you, their process <laughs> was a filing cabinet and opening it and having Manila <laughs> folders that were alphabetized um, by client name or by date. And um, unfortunately, our town, I think it was May of 2010, flooded. I'm talking like homes were underwater, like I-24, inter our interstate, everything was underwater. And it was a Saturday. I didn't have a wedding that day, but my, a lot of my vendors were texting me pictures of box trucks and lighting equipment and all their stuff floating away. Mm. And, and our, I mean, our, our little downtown, our city was pretty much destroyed. Um, but we all came together as a community. And aside from the eight displaced events we just had, um, I mean, so many buildings were ruined. There were some of our vendors, they had to file bankruptcy and start over because they didn't have flood insurance. Mm -hmm. And so then they all came to me and said, okay, Angela, like, what's this paperless thing? Like, what's Dropbox? Like, what are all these different apps that you use? Um, we'll listen. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, w one Sunday, I'm like, everybody bring all your computers and your devices, and I'll show you guys what I know and how mm -hmm. we do it. And now we're on such a fluid, solid system of sharing drop boxes and, and all. It's just so much more easy, and the communication and accountability is so different in a good way. Mm -hmm. But it thinks that it took a tragedy for them to open up and say, okay, we're ready for change. So be proactive. Don't wait for a fire mm -hmm. or to drop a hard drive or drop your computer or someone to steal it or anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some students leave my tech class like scared. I'm like, how many of you are backing up on carbonite or, hard, or a hard drive? You know, they just kind of look at you deer in he headlights mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I feel stupid. I'm like, don't, because I was there. That's how I learned from my, not mistakes, but opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then they race to the store to get a hard drive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, I think as a business, you always have to see what is your weaknesses. If something was to happen, what would you yeah. do? And, you know, I've been in the wedding videography business for many years. And one of the things early in my business, I was saying, you know, I would, you know, we're always charging power, your battery packs, what have you. And I said to myself, what if there wasn't any power where yeah. I was at and I couldn't charge my batteries or I couldn't charge? Well, let me tell you, this was really on my mind at a wedding. I mean, how many years ago? I bought and purchased a battery belt in mm -hmm. case as like a backup yeah. if I needed anything. Two weeks later, after I purchased this battery pack, our venue, the telephone pole was hit on the street. It was the only venue in town that had no power. Of course. Yeah. So here I am, solid, because I had bought the battery belt. Thank God. There was no air conditioning. There was no lights. The people, the, the, <laughs> I mean, the wedding, even to this day, they're still together. Yeah. But the mother said it was a wedding from hell. <laughs> you know? But I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just one of, I mean, that's going to happen no yeah. matter what. You know, they didn't have a generator. And yeah. that $600 for that generator would have saved probably... 30 plus thousand dollars that they invested. I mean, that's why with outdoor weddings in some of these places, like I'll ask, people are like, why do you care? Like, that's an off the wall question. I'm like, because it's happened to me before. Like I, I asked <laughs> private homes, I'm like, how many times can we flush your potty? <laughs> they're like, what? I'm like, are you on septic? Or, you know, it's things like, and they're like, why? I'm like, because I've had a septic tank blow up before and it did not smell good. And mm -hmm. we had to put the guests back on the bus and we had to end early. Mm -hmm. So it's those experiences sometimes that teach us, but then like you were just being proactive mm -hmm. and thinking like, what if? And it's good to think that way to make sure that you're caring for your services and not letting what's going on around you affect you and hinder you. Well, you, what you'll find funny about this wedding, the DJ had a generator. Oh! Guess what happened though? It caught on fire. <laughs> on fire <laughs> i don't know what i mean i don't know what he did after so that i don't remember <laughs> it's been too long ago but it was, it wedding was a hell. wedding i've always used as being you know one of those weird freaky mm -hmm. events that just you know the wedding was planned well by the yeah. mother 
I mean, she I had done her previous daughter's wedding. Yeah. And it was perfect. Yeah. But that was it's not those one. unexpected things that come up that happen at every wedding. Mm -hmm. And then it's like if you have a good planner that can jump mm -hmm. into action mm -hmm. and keep the drama private mm -hmm. because we are not there to be superheroes. Right. We're being paid to fix issues and challenges that come up. And I try to keep things in the background every once in a while, you know, somebody goes and mouths off to the bride, like, bah, 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 and I'm like, <laughs> stop talking. We're handling it. We're professionals. We deal with this stuff all the time. Um, when sometimes it's the first time <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> that there was a flood, like yeah. that was the first time. Um, but you handle it and it makes you a better, stronger business owner. And, mm. you know, you learn from it and you move on. Yeah. So do you have any closing thoughts? Um, closing thoughts. I would just say, like, if you're a planner or a designer and you want to expand your services, to make sure that you get a coach or a mentor or listen to some books or read some books and get guidance because that's what I've done. And I've been in some great catalyst programs and great entrepreneur organizations and, and just networking with business owners and like mine professionals that can help me grow and so like we've actually started which Julie started this a, a private Facebook group online where wedding professionals can collaborate and share their challenges and get feedback with hmm. I mean thousands of people so we re recently started the wedding tribe <laughs> It's like a little tribe um, for wedding professionals and specifically wedding planners as well as small business owners so that people could reach out and know that there is help out there. And I know in our industry, people tell me all the time, if I had a dollar for every time I heard it, people in my town won't share. People in my town won't help me. They don't have intern programs. Why do you teach people to do what you do? And I'm like, Bec there, there's no threat there. Like, people will hire you based off your experience, based off your education and what you've learned, and really your personality and ideas. Mm -hmm. And as planners and designers, we're all individuals. So I, I don't understand why people, you know, won't be helpful, but definitely surround yourself with the right people to make sure that you're successful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, well, everyone, this has um, been Wedding Market Live here on Facebook, and we'll be signing off uh, from this broadcast. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.